back at Parkwood Baptist Church. It's good to see everybody here tonight. If you're able to, would like to, have a stand. And, uh, we're going to sing some courses tonight. Today.
with the Emmanuel next. <laughs> Amen. All right, you can be seated tonight, and we greet you this evening for our midweek Bible study, worship service here at Parkwood. Thank you, Mark, and musicians for leading us in those choruses this, uh, to begin tonight. We appreciate that very much. Let me make a few announcements, and we will 
we will move, move forward into the service uh, tonight. Uh, ladies, your, your final Bible study uh, in the study through Jude is tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. And so keep that in mind, tomorrow morning, 9.30 a.m. here at the church. And uh, that is session six of six. And so uh, remember that. Um, this coming Sunday is Father's Day, and so just a reminder there, we will have normal services in the morning, Sunday School 10, worship at 11, uh, no evening service though this Sunday. Um, speaking of this weekend, uh, Dylan and Jenny have a pretty big weekend ahead for them, and uh, they'll, uh, they'll be tying the knot Saturday, and we'll, uh, we'll try to tie it real, real tight for you on Saturday, all right? And, uh, be tying the things. Wedding starts at five o'clock. Is that right? Saturday, five o'clock, and uh, that's important information. And so, if you want to attend that, um, I know that would be an encouragement to them. And so, but be pray, praying for them as they start their their uh, their marriage. And certainly, we're proud of them, proud for them, and uh, wish nothing nothing but the very best for them in their future. And so, they'll be like I said, be getting married Saturday here at the church at 5 o'clock, and so if you can attend, you are certainly welcome to. Um, coming up later this month, Brother Mike Courtney will be uh, preaching uh, on Sunday, June the 30th, in both services, and so remember that. Brother Mike is no stranger here. He has, he has been here numerous times. Um, I do think it's his first, first time in this building, I think, but he has been at our church uh, numerous times in the past, and if you haven't heard Brother Mike, you'll certainly be, uh, be blessed by his preaching of God's Word. And I will be in Pine Ridge, South Dakota uh, with Ken, Brother Ken Trivet, our missionary in South Dakota. And so I appreciate your prayers for that. Uh, coming up in July, the 22nd through the 26th, um, we'll be having Vacation Bible School. And so remember that. That's a Monday through Friday. Starts at 9 a.m. and goes through noon each day. And then uh, says there will be a commencement Friday at 7 p.m. And so remember these things. Registration upcoming for kindergarten through fifth grade. If you have any questions about that, uh, see Miss Joni Smith. I was going to say you could see Joni or Lori, my wife Lori, but she's not here. Uh, Avid had a little scare the other day. He fell in the shower and busted his head open real good right here. He got three staples in the back of his head. And uh, we can go ahead and put that picture up there, Ben, if you want to show him that gruesomeness. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyways, he... Uh, didn't think it'd be good for him to come tonight with the temptation of playground, and and he's all boy too. He, he he'll be wanting to wrestle after church and things like that. So so they're at home tonight. But uh, if you have any questions about VBS, see see Miss Joni Smith. She'll answer those for you. I mentioned Jenny and Dylan after the service tonight. If any of you men can help help, uh, Dylan's going to need some help moving some furniture. All right. So getting this thing ready for for the wedding Saturday. So if a few of you can help uh, help move Lord's supper table, pulpit, things like that. Uh, stick around if you don't mind just for a few minutes. All right. I don't know of any other announcements. Um, you can take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 13. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 13. Now, we will close our study through the book of Hebrews here in the next, next month for sure. We are certainly coming to a rapid conclusion. Really, the book... Uh, uh, the the portion, the, the meat of the book, if you will, the, the, the heavy content ends with chapter 12. And chapter 13 almost reads like a, like a PS at the end of a letter. And, uh, and so what I want to do tonight is just, just kind of overview chapter 13 as a whole, and then we'll come back over the next few weeks and just hit some of the, the main verses for individual sermons to close out this study. Last week I played a round of golf, and that's not breaking news. Um, but, but I tell you what makes it different right now is that when I played, it was about 98 degrees. And most of you would ask the question, why? Why would you, why, why would you do that, play a round of golf in 98-degree heat? I'll tell you why, because I enjoy playing golf. Uh, I, I love playing golf. Weather conditions really don't change how I feel about golfing. Now, if you were to ask me in 98-degree he had another question, do you want to do and give another activity like fishing or something? I'd probably say, no, thank you. Um, I enjoy fishing, but not as much as I enjoy playing golf. Um, you say, what's different? Well, I'm different. I'm different. 
I'm not as willing to sacrifice for other things like I am for a round of golf. And you know the truth is that if I wait for perfect weather conditions in Houston, Texas, I wouldn't get to play much golf. Uh, and, uh, and so are there other conditions I would prefer more than 98 degrees? Well, sure, sure. But again, I wouldn't get to play much if I waited for perfect conditions. Now, we've been in the last part of Hebrews for a little while now, and the writer has, has compared the daily Christian life to a race, a marathon, if you will, a grueling marathon. Sometimes there are conditions that make the race of life a little bit more challenging. Sometimes there are sacrifices that must be made. Sometimes the race of life is, uh, is uh, a little more painful at times than at others, and you wish things were different, but you don't quit. You don't give up. You don't put, you know, push pause and wait for more favorable conditions and circumstances and then start running again. Why? Because you're a Christian. Running the Christian race is what you're passionate about. It's who you are. It's what you do. It's what you were made for. It's what you were saved for. It's what you are gifted for. It's why you're still here to run for Christ to run with Christ, to run to Christ. And one of these days, the race is going to finally be over, and you'll see Jesus Christ face to face, and you'll realize that it was certainly worth it all. Now, at the end of chapter 12, the writer calls for everyone in his audience to really make a decision. Uh, for those who have yet to believe the gospel and be saved, he pleads with them to give their heart to Christ. For those who are saved but are tempted uh, to, to give up, to, to go back, uh, to their previous life, uh, because maybe the Christian race, the life that, that they're living as a Christian has gotten too tough. He pleads with them to, to keep going, to persevere, to push through. And for those who are saved and are persevering in that sense, uh, the harsh conditions of the Christian life, the Christian race, he encourages them to just keep going, to put one foot in front of the other and to continue on for the cause of Christ. True gospel-believing will always reveal itself in genuine gospel living. If you're passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will show in how you live your everyday life. And the question could be asked, well, how? Well, that's what the, the writer of the book of Hebrews concludes with. Again, I said it a moment ago, chapter 13 is almost like a bunch of uh, PSs at the end of a letter. P.S. This is what it looks like. For you to live a life, uh, a gospel-centered life, no matter the climate, no matter the circumstances, no matter the difficult conditions. And uh, the more I look at chapter 13, I'm very convinced that, that the writer of Hebrews is doing exactly that. He's saying, hey, for 12, for 12 chapters now, we've, we've talked about the Christian life, the gospel-centered life. P.S., here's how you make that practical. Here's how you live that. Let me give you four main points that that uh, the author shows and says that, that real gospel believing will translate into your life. It will show itself in real gospel living. And then he ends it with just a very common benediction. Um, number one, real gospel living, gospel-centered living. Living the gospel will include practicing hospitality. Notice what the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number one, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Now, stop there for a moment. He gives three specific groups of people to whom you and I need to practice hospitality. He says those in the church, that's the brethren, the brothers and sisters in Christ, um, those outside the church, strangers, then those in bounds, literally in prison, those in prison, he's likely referring to believers who have been jailed for their Christian faith, and he's saying don't forget them, don't abandon them, uh, take care of them as if it were you, because you never know it could one day be you. Selfless love, hospitality, is a defining mark of a real Christian, of a Christ follower. True love provides what is needed, and that's really what hospitality is. Is Now, if you read the text, you might get confused. You see the word entertain in verse number two, uh, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. That's not the word entertain in the sense that you and I would use the term, the word entertain or entertainment. 
Uh, the, the word literally in the Greek text is where we get our English word hospitality. And, uh, and so sometimes we, we confuse hospitality with entertainment, and there's a difference. We, we think, generally speaking, that hospitality is having people over to the house to enjoy a delicious meal, and we have to clean the house to the point that it looks like nobody has ever lived there, and, and uh, that, that's entertainment. Uh, not necessarily hospitality. Now, it might include hospitality, but it's not necessarily hospitality. One writer said this, that the difference between entertainment and hospitality is entertainment is primarily concerned about the setting. Hospitality is primarily concerned about the people. And so hospitality is focused on the need of the person and does whatever, whatever it takes to meet that need. And of course, that that includes a lot of things, financial needs, but there are a lot of needs that money cannot really touch. Now, when you get a chance tonight without being creepy, take a look around. Take a look around. You'll find that most people in this room, if not everybody in this room, has enough money to meet their needs. Now, I didn't say uh, wants and greeds, but at least enough to meet their needs, and there may not be much, if anything, left over after, but you've met your needs. But there are people all around you that have needs that money just simply cannot touch, that money cannot buy. Maybe it's a need for genuine conversation. Maybe it's a need for a listening ear. Maybe it's a shoulder to cry on. Maybe it's an encouraging letter or an email or a reassuring hug. Or maybe someone just needs a home-cooked meal delivered to their home or an interceding prayer. The list could be a mile long, but gospel impacted people, people who have, who have been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, possess a gospel-shaped love that is attentive to the needs of others and then lovingly provides what is needed. That's hospitality. That, that's the hospitality that's being emphasized here. It requires selflessness, uh, compassionate love that Jesus Christ certainly displayed everywhere that he went. We meet the needs of others, not when we feel like it, but we meet the needs of others when we see it, when we see it. No matter where you are, no matter uh, who it is, when the Lord reveals a need to you that you can meet, then it is your invitation from the Lord to get involved. He says something interesting in here. He says, for, for, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I think, this is my opinion, that he's referencing, referring to Genesis chapter 18. Uh, if you recall, Abraham Abraham showed hospitality to three travelers. He provided them food and, and a place to rest, and two of them turned out to be angels. Uh, one of them turned out to be a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And I think the main point here uh, is that showing hospitality is similar to a sacrament in a sense, meaning that, that by doing it for others who you can see, you're really doing it for Jesus Christ who you cannot see. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25? Uh, he said this, he said he's going to look at the church and he's going to say this, Matthew 25, 35, for I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we uh, thee as hungry and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When did we see thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when we saw thee sick or in prison and came unto you, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Listen, it is not a Christian feature to feel bad for people who are hungry. It is not a Christian feature to feel bad for people who are broke, who are naked, who are sick. That is a human feature. That's a human feature. Most people sympathize with those who are in those situations. What makes it Christ-like is taking it upon yourself to do something about it. If you have been impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, gospel-impacted people not only feel bad for them, but they, they love them enough to, to do something about it. When's the last time that you saw a real need, a true need, and you went out of your way to help provide for that need. Gospel-centered people, they will, they will practice hospitality. Then he says, secondly, that the people who live gospel-centered lives will respect marriage. And again, no matter the culture, 
no matter the climate, no matter the conditions, they'll respect marriage. Notice in verse number four. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now the word honor there means precious, it means valued, it means prized. And so gospel-centered living continually respects and honors marriage. Now honoring marriage is important, uh, largely because of the picture uh, that it shows. It pictures something a lot greater and a lot bigger. You remember in Ephesians chapter 5, I think it is, it says that the relationship between the husband and the wife is a picture of the way that Christ loves the church. He loves her unceasingly and she submits to him. And so if you dishonor and disrespect marriage, you are dishonoring and disrespecting God's picture of redemption. Now let me give you a couple of ways that we respect marriage and we honor marriage. Number one, we agree with God on what it is. All right? Since God is the designer of marriage, he also gets to be the definer of marriage as well. And so we or anyone else tries to redefine what marriage is, we dishonor it. We dishonor it. God has defined marriage. In the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says, God says, therefore, a man shall, shall leave his father and his mother, be joined unto his wife, and they shall become one. Now listen to me. Listen to me. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Conservatives didn't say that. Baptists didn't say that. God said that. God says this is marriage. It's between a man and a woman. No wonder Satan wants people to be confused on what constitutes a man and a woman. If you can't define what a person is, then you really can't defend who they can or cannot marry. You see the ploy that's being played by the devil. Now this may be hard to hear, but it's true. There is no such thing. Don't get mad at me. Again, God said this. There is no such thing as same-sex marriage. It doesn't exist. It's impossible. It's impossible. Same-sex marriage doesn't exist because it can exist. We can call that relationship all kinds of things. But marriage is not one of them. Marriage is not one of them. Why? Because God, who again designed marriage, therefore is the only one who has a right to define marriage, says that it is a spiritual and a physical union between one man and one woman, between a husband and a wife. That's the end of the story. That's the period right there. Whatever God has defined, it's never smart and never safe for you and I to try to redefine. And let me just interject this. This is not a political issue, all right? Uh, th this is not even a cultural issue. This is not a personal issue. This is a spiritual issue that goes to the very core of Christianity. You say, Pastor, you sound really unloving. Well, if you think that, you've misunderstood what loving is. Friend, to contradict God's word in order to condone a sinful lifestyle is not loving. It's not. It's just not. Loving is, is caring so deeply for someone that you'll tell them the truth, even at the risk of that relationship. Uh, friend, if I've got cancer, the most loving thing a doctor can do for me is not call my cancer a cold and, and tell me to take some Tylenol and I'll feel better. The most loving thing that doctor can do for me is tell me the truth. By calling my cancer, cancer, and then giving me a plan of attack to get rid of it. That, that's loving me. That, that's helping me. Same-sex marriage is just another way Satan will help humans dishonor marriage and ultimately corrupt the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can honor marriage and, and respect marriage by agreeing with God on what it is. But then by avoiding sexual immorality, and he says it right here in the text, he says to keep the marriage bed pure. That is, no sex outside of marriage, no sex before marriage, you, you, you say, well, it's not referring to me. I'm not even married. Did you know that Satan can mess up your marriage before you're even married? You realize that, don't you? Uh, when you give in, young people, listen to me. When you give in to sexual temptation or you give in your mind to, to uh, pornography or your body to another person before marriage, you have just opened the door and invited Satan to, to, to ruin and damage your future marriage before it ever takes place. And that's why it says marriage is to be honored by all. By all, by, by everyone, including those who are not married. If you'll honor your marriage before you're even married, you'll have a much better marriage when you are married. And I promise you and guarantee you that. 
Some people have damaged their marriage before they even met their spouse. Uh, they didn't honor marriage before they were married. They didn't honor that future husband, that, that future wife. They didn't treat them as prized and valuable. You, you hear this and you think, Pastor, I've really messed up. Is it too late for me? Am I doomed to have a terrible marriage? Well, well, well no. No, I've got good news for you. It's not too late. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 11 says this, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gives this long list of pretty wicked sins. Idolaters, fornicators, abusers, all of these things. But verse 11 is a good verse. It says, And such were, past tense, some of you. But you are washed, and you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Friend, when I tell you the gospel changes everything, the gospel changes everything. Through the gospel, God changed you, God forgave you, you were dirty, now you're clean, you were perverted, now you're perfected. Uh, you, you are an enemy of God, but now you're a child of God. How? By believing, by putting your faith that Christ died for your sin, for all of your sin, in your place. And the punishment for your sin that belonged to you, that should have been on you, was placed on Christ. And God looked at Christ as if he had lived your life or my life, and now he looks at me and looks at you if you've been saved as if you lived his life. My sin on Christ, Christ's righteousness on me. Friend, the good news of the gospel is that God is a lot better forgiver than you are a sinner. And by the way, you are a really good sinner. I'm a really good sinner. But praise God, he's a much better forgiver than I am a sinner. And uh, believe the gospel. Turn from your sin and he'll save you and he'll cleanse you and he'll supply you all the power that you need to live a gospel-centered life that honors and respects marriage. You'll practice hospitality. You'll, you'll respect and honor marriage. Thirdly, living a gospel-centered life, you will, you will pursue contentment. You'll pursue contentment. Notice in verse number 5, he says, Let your conversation, your, your life, be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I'll give you a paraphrase. In essence, what he's saying in verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money. And by the way, that's not a one-time battle. That's not a one-time battle. Loving money is a constant threat. It's a constant threat. Therefore, contentment must, must be a constant pursuit on your end, on my end. Contentment is that eternal peace, that eternal satisfaction that doesn't require any change to external circumstances. Contentment is the belief that I have everything that I need at this present moment. It is the confidence that if I needed something else, God would have provided something else for me. And it's the certainty that if that day comes when I do need something else, God will make sure I have it. And he tells us how to possess the power to be content. He gives us two promises that we need to believe. Number one, God says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, I read that in my Greek New Testament Last night, and here's what the Greek literally says. I will never, ever leave you. No, I will never, never, never forsake you. There are five negatives in that verse in the Greek language. Five. He's saying if you have God, if you have God, then is there really anything else that you can be deprived of that would devastate you? One writer said this. I thought this was good. He said the person who has God and nothing else really doesn't have that much less than the one who has God and everything else. It all belongs to God anyways, and he can get what you need in a heartbeat. Contentment is understanding that in Christ, you can be satisfied with exactly what you have because in Christ you have everything you need. On the other hand, discontentment is just another way of saying you're disappointed with what God has done for you. You're disappointed in God for how God has provided for you, that he hasn't done enough for you, at the heart of discontentment is a distrust in God as your provider. And so he says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. But then here's another promise. He says, the Lord is my helper, so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. The God who loved you so he wouldn't let death, hell, or a cross keep him from rescuing you, that God promises to help you in all things. Isn't that a good promise? The Lord is my helper. You ever need any help in life? You've got a helper. You've got a helper through the gospel. God has proven 
and provided and proven his willingness to help us no matter what it takes. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God has promised to provide all that we need. And really the reason that contentment is, uh, is difficult, and it is. Contentment can be a hard thing, and it's hard for most of us because it's something that has to be learned. Um, you, you're not born content. We're, we're born discontent. We're, we're born with a desire to want more and to, to, to gain more. Um, Philippians 4.11, Paul said, Not that I am speaking of need and want, for I have learned in whatsoever situation I am to be, in whatsoever state I am to be content. He says, I learned it. And so the, the Greeks had a few different words for the word learned, but the one that Paul uses here is one that, that, that means that I learned it by experience, that I went through some things and, and learned contentment. That means there was a time when Paul wasn't content. That there was a time he couldn't have penned that verse and been truthful about it. And so God put him in situations where he had to learn it for himself. He went through the fire. He went through experiences. Again, contentment. You're not born with contentment. It's not a personality trait that, that some people have and, and some people don't have. Contentment is something that we all have to grow in, that we all have to learn. That means that God has to put us in circumstances from time to time that make us uncomfortable we're not necessarily going to enjoy to teach us to be content no matter what. And so you want to live a gospel-centered life? You'll practice hospitality. You'll respect and honor marriage. Uh, you'll be content. And then fourthly, you'll honor the church. How will you honor the church? Well, notice a few things. He's going to talk about following the leaders of the church. He mentions it twice. Now, our flesh opposes authority um, naturally. But again, the gospel changes everything. Notice in verse 7. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And I think, my opinion, verse 7 is a reference to pastors who have, uh, who have passed on, who have uh, already died and went to heaven. And in essence, what he's saying is remember the word they taught. Look at the results of their life. Why? Because the word doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. They, that, that pastor may not be with us any longer, but what they taught you in word and deed stays the same. Jesus hadn't changed. The gospel hadn't changed. The word of God hadn't changed. Later on in verse 17, he says, Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. And so God didn't give us pastors just to to marry us and bury us. He gave us pastors uh, for, uh, for a job that, 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 that they're going to be held accountable for. He says they're to watch over your souls. Isn't that an assignment? Um, I, was, I was watching a sermon on this text recently, and the pastor said, I'm not saying my job's tougher than yours, but it is. And, uh, of course, that was a joke. He says here, he says, submit to the authority. Submit. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. He says to submit to the authority that God gave them. And then this is an interesting phrase. He says um, that they may do it with joy. So like, watch for your souls, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. In essence, what he's saying is su submit to the authority that God gave them because when it's easier for them, then it's going to benefit you. And that's what he's saying. One day, pastors are going to be held accountable for how they led the church. But on the flip side of that coin, the church is going to be held accountable for how they submitted and followed their pastor. Now, this doesn't make a pastor a king with his subjects. He's assuming that pastors are preaching the word of God and modeling the life of Christ. And as that pastor does that, the church is to cooperate joyfully, willingly. And if the church doesn't, then they'll answer for that. He says... Um, Follow your leaders. Then he says, stick to the scripture. Notice in verse 9, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrine. For it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, uh, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they that have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. In, in other words, if I could sum verse 9 and 10 up in one sentence, he's saying, look, don't go back to legalism. Don't go back to that. Don't think godliness is expressed by, by what you eat or what you don't eat. Don't let false teachers come in and, and sway you with extra biblical things that, that sound real spiritual, but they're not. He says, stick to the new covenant. 
Stick to it. Stick to the Bible. Stick to Scripture. And then he says in verse 11, then stand with Jesus. He says, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, they're burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For he... Uh, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And so the readers were looking for ways to continue as, as, a, as a Christian while at the same time escaping persecution of being connected with Jesus Christ. And the writer is saying it just can't be done. It's impossible. He's saying don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed to say his name or to profess devotion to him or love for him, no matter what it costs you. Jesus died for us on a cross outside the city of Jerusalem is what he's saying. And even if it puts you outside the goodwill of the people in this city, go to Jesus, stand for Jesus, praise him, serve him, worship him, live for him, share him, stand with Jesus. And he says in verse 18, pray for us, that is uh, leaders in the church, pray for us for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. But I beseech you, the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. Verse 20, he's talking about serving through Christ. Uh, now the God of peace that brought you again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and forever. And he says, Amen. You know that our church, our church has everything we need to do everything that we have, that we have been called to do. You realize that? And it, that's all been provided by God to and through you, his people. Um, doesn't matter if it's financial need or spiritual need or physical need, God has provided. He's provided to meet those needs through his people, through members of the church. And every single one of us is equipped specifically for this body in this time of history. Realize that? We're here at this time in this place for reason, for reason. All we have to do is recognize how we've been gifted, as we're talking about on Sunday nights, and how we've been equipped and then step up and meet the needs as they come. So I ask you in closing, how's your race going? How's your race going? Are you living a gospel-centered life? Um, does it show in how you live, no matter the conditions, no matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on in your life, around your life, no matter if it's painful and hard? Or life is a yellow brick road right now for you. Does it show in how you practice hospitality? How you honor and respect marriage, how you, how you pursue contentment, and how you honor God's church. Does your life show those things? Let me show you how the writer ends this letter, and I'll be done. I'll close with this. In Hebrews chapter 13, notice he ends it with this. In verse 22, he says, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, literally, literally the word of encouragement. For I've written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if... He comes shortly, I'll see you. Salute all them that have rule over you, and all the saints, they have Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Amen. Gospel-centered living. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. We'll pick back up next Wednesday with some select verses in chapter 13, and then we'll move to our next, our next midweek study uh, later this summer. Amen. Thank you for your attendance and your attention tonight. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you, uh, some of you, Saturday, if you come for Dylan and Jenny's wedding, and certainly Sunday for Father's Day. And so remember that. Remember that. A few of you men can, can uh, help, help them out move some furniture. I know they would appreciate that as well. Amen. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer tonight.